Uh, yeah. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today we are with uh Mohammed here. Uh, uh, so we are honored to have him as a guest speaker to deliver this session to talk about uh the theory of the uh computability, especially talk about golden uh incompleteness theorem and hotting problem and even deeper the uh MRDP theorem. So welcome Mohammed. Welcome Sarah and thank you for the invitation. Yeah, welcome, uh, Cecil. Thanks for joining us, and thanks everyone here. Shall we wait for a couple of minutes? Uh, yeah. So, uh, we will wait a couple of minutes. Uh, I will just let everyone know. So today's format will be. Uh, the Mohammed will uh give a a quick introduction about him. Uh, himself and also his research and his interests and then we will go to uh, the topic today uh, Mohammed will guide us for a quick uh, overview and then we will open the floor to the Q&A session and even the open discussion if we have more time also, uh, the room chat is open here. So if you are, uh, you want to chat in the room chat, please feel free to do so. Uh, you can also post your questions there if you are, are not available to speak, and uh, the moderator here will help you to uh, poke the question uh, to the yeah to our speaker. Okay, I think maybe we can start. Uh, so I, uh, I shared the uh, the link about Professor uh, Mohammed. Uh, it's this is his homepage. So as you can see, uh, he uh, has a huge interest in the math mathematics, especially uh, some lots of the interesting theorem. So we are very honored to have him today to talk about the notion of the computability to touch base about the golden church and the Turing, uh, even the beyond. So, um, yeah, Mohammed, if uh, can I pass the mic to you so you can quick a quick introduction about your research and then we can, yeah, start the talk. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you again, Sierra. Thank you, Cecil, for the invitation. My name is Mohamed Barakat. I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of Siegen in Germany. My interest is something called computer algebra. This is um, a subfield of what is called constructive mathematics. So I'm interested in this sort of mathematics that has an algorithmic interpretation. So where the proof has an algorithmic interpretation and actually we're, we're coming from the other side we're really interested not in the algorithms we can extract from the proofs but we really um, try to design very good algorithms so proofs that perform very well algorithmically and in this sense we are um, on the extreme spectrum of people doing constructive mathematics um, so I'm not um, a specialist, a specialist in logic, but of course the uh, the topics we'll speak about today are, um, I would say, of general interest. So I will speak about them um, as someone who's generally interested in this stuff, but definitely not as an expert. If you need more details about these subjects, then uh, I think you have uh, to invite more specialized people, maybe logicians, or um, and I can give you more names and I can point you to lectures where people really can go into more details. But I think for uh, from what I understood from Sierra, uh, my knowledge would might be enough for today. And maybe for the discussion and otherwise I'll give you pointers. So uh, today we want to speak about uh, three different things. We want to speak about Gödel's incompleteness theorem and we want to speak about uh, uh, Turing 
halting problem and about the so-called MRDP theorem uh, as the last thing. And um, I find actually uh, that this is a modern way to speak to speak about uh, Gödel incompleteness. And um, I hope I can explain to you why uh, you would see Gödel incompleteness in a different way if you um, know also about the halting problem and the MRDP theorem. So first of all, uh, let's just start with the notion of incompleteness. So there are several notions of completeness and the incompleteness, which is, or the completeness, which is referred to in the incompleteness theorem is uh, roughly the following. We say that a theory, which is given by some axioms, is complete if uh, for any statement um, given in the language of this theory, you can either prove uh, the statement or you can prove its negation. And uh, I can give you very simple examples of incomplete theory, and actually theories you already know of. So if you, for example, take um, group theory, you know that group theory is given by three axioms, three very simple axioms. And you don't even need groups, you just maybe need monoids. So uh, you can start with uh, the two axiom of a monoid. So a monoid is a set with a, a binary operation. So given two elements in the monoid, you can uh, uh, multiply them and you get another element of the monoid. So that uh, this multiplication in the monoid has uh, satisfies two axioms. The first axiom is telling you that this uh, multiplication on the monoid is associative, so uh, bracketing is irrelevant. So it's the same if you take uh, three elements A, B, and C, and first you multiply E and B, and then multiply them with C, you'll get the same element as if you first multiply A and then uh, you first uh, you first multiply B and C, and then take the product of A times the bracket of B and C. This is called associativity. And after you have this law, you can simply um, safely drop bracketing. And the second axiom is about the uh, um, existence of a unit element. So uh, this is an element such that you, multi you can multiply it with an element in the monoid from the left and from the right, and nothing happens. So 1 times a is equal to a is equal to a times 1. This is a very simple example of a non-complete theory for example, because there are monoids which are commutative and monoids which are not commutative. So commutativity would be a statement So about a monoid, namely that for all elements A and B, uh, it, uh, the order of that multiplication doesn't matter. Yeah? So A, A times B is equals B times A. And of course, we know of monoids which are commutative, and we know about other monoids which are not commutative. Yeah. So if you would have just the statement of it, the monoid is commutative, you would neither find a proof for the statement nor a, pro nor a proof for the counter statement, for the negation of the statement. So this is, of course, um, an, a very simple example of a very incomplete theory. Yeah? But of course, you can make this theory complete. Uh, Maybe you can even uh, add the, uh, the axiom of uh, inverses, so you, then you get the group axioms, uh, but still the theory is incomplete. And then you can maybe add one more axiom to tell you something like that the group has three elements. And once you end up having just one model for the theory, the theory becomes complete. Yeah. So in this sense, we're talking about um, completeness and incompleteness on very simple examples. So you don't need to be a logician to understand what the notion is about. So uh, before we start with the statement, uh, let me tell you how to make complete theories. So for example, you can take a model of the natural numbers and then say, I want uh, to take the following axiom system of the natural numbers. I simply take all the true statements about the natural numbers. Yeah, you uh, in a tautological way, you of course get a complete theory. Yeah, because every true statement is now even an axiom. Right. Good. So um, th 
this is important to note that you can even make the theory of natural numbers in this way also complete, that you simply take all valid statements as axioms. What Gödel is about is something different. It's about not taking any axiom system like the one I just took by saying I will take all true statements in the natural numbers, but he insisted on taking an axiom, um, an algorithmic axiom system. So an algorithmic axiom system is a system where I have a, a computer program that I can stick in the statement and the computer program um, uh, terminates and tells me, yes, this is an axiom or this is not an axiom. So if I take the set of all true statements about natural numbers, this axiomatic system is not algorithmic. Yeah. So uh, the incompleteness theorem is the following. So if you take um, any theory which is strong enough to express the natural numbers uh, and the arithmetic of the natural numbers, for example, encoded by so-called piano arithmetic or Robinson arithmetic, uh, then you can prove uh, that um, there are statements that you can neither prove nor disprove given any axiomatize, any algorithmic axiomatic system of the natural numbers. So if you insist that your system is a uh, system of axiom is algorithmically searchable, that you can algorithmically decide if something is um, an axiom or not, then the completeness cannot be true if the uh, system of axiom you're starting with is consistent. And Gödel proved this uh, by, first of all, uh, introducing the notion of algorithm in a hidden way, because at that time we didn't have Turing machine. We we're talking about 1931. So my point is you cannot really understand Gödel incompleteness without understanding that he was talking about algorithmic axiomatic systems. Yeah, so systems uh, where you can decide if something is an axiom or not by an algorithm. So um, his computability theory, and then we leave good a little bit uh, and then go to uh, the notion of computability. So his notion of computability is called recursive functions. So this is the language he needed to develop in order to say, uh, to say, I don't want the axiomatic system consisting of all true statements about arithmetic, but I want to have a system which I can decide if something is an axiom or not. So he wanted to say, I wanted to program. And for this, he invented the so-called um, recursive functions. And um, But he wasn't really sure that he captured the full notion of computability. And uh, afterwards, uh, he was in contact with Church, so he proved the, this theorem in 1931, but he wasn't really sure that he captured what does it mean to be algorithmic. And then he uh, met Church uh, in Princeton, and Church uh, introduced him to his lambda calculus. And Gödel wasn't also uh, happy with lambda calculus because he wasn't really sure that this also captured the entire notion of what is an algorithm or computability. But already 1936, Turing came to uh, Princeton to uh, do his PhD thesis with Alonzo Church. And um, in this year, he introduced the notion of a Turing machine. And this is a very intuitive notion of what is an algorithm. Algorithm belongs to the few notions of in mathematics, which are primitive. So you cannot really explain them by other things, but you have to take them in an informal way. We don't have a formal way to explain them in mathematics. Um, uh, if you think of Turing machines as being formal, then okay, this is uh, how you define a formality. But in mathematics, we say that this is an informal definition of what an algorithm is. And the nice thing about um, Turing's thesis is that he, a PhD thesis, because there's something else called the church Turing thesis, so the nice thing about um, uh, Alan Turing's PhD thesis, which was advised by Alonzo Church, is that he proved that all these prior systems of computations, all these notions of what is an algorithm, the one invented by Gödel and the one invented by called recursive functions, the one invented by 
church called Lambda Calculus, and he, his Turing machines are all equivalent. And when uh, when uh, Gödel saw this definition of computability, he was very happy because he then understood that he really grasped uh, by his recursive functions the general notion he had in mind about computability. And um, by now we know that there is even a model which predates uh, these three models. The three models, again, are recursive functions of Gödel, the lambda calculus of Church, and the uh, Turing machines of Alan Turing. There is um, a model which is called combinators that um, was invented or discovered, <laughs> uh, depending on your philosophy, um, by um, Moses Schönfinkel, who was at that time uh, doing his um, habilitation thesis with uh, with David Hilbert in Göttingen. And these um, combinators are also another model of computation. So they're also Turing complete. So we already had the notion of computation invented three times, uh, four times, uh, or three times prior to Turing. And with Turing, we were, uh, or humanity was sure that um, it got uh, the right notion because the notion of a Turing machine was so intuitive. And um, as you know, the Turing machine um, then developed further by John von Neumann became what we call today the von Neumann machine, which is the basis of uh, today's computers. And if you go back to Gödel's incompleteness theorem, then you will see that he managed to embed logic inside, uh, inside arithmetic. And if you think about it from a modern point of view, this is, of course, nothing that you uh, would um, think would be genius. But at that time, it was genius. We didn't have computers. Today, you know, you already have computer algebra systems or things like Mathematica or Maple, and of course you can do logic inside them. But at that time, it was really um, um, it was really an act of a genius. So what he managed is to embed the language of logic inside the language of arithmetic, where he was then able to even uh, express the notion of proof inside so proof is a logical notion, and he was able to restate it as a statement about uh, uh, as a statement in arithmetic. The details are a bit subtle, uh, but then after he was able to embed logic, including the notion of a proof inside arithmetic, he the last the last coup that he did was to uh, be able to encode the liar's paradox inside the whole thing by uh, being able to uh, formulate a statement which says about itself, I am not provable. So if this statement is true, then it's not provable. So this means I wouldn't have a proof for it. So it would be a true statement without a proof. And if there would have been a proof, then the statement would be sem semantically wrong, you know, because it's saying about itself that I have no proof. And uh, people afterwards were really puzzled about this, and uh, Hilbert was a bit furious uh, because he thought that uh, uh, we should be able to know everything. So he had three open problems at that time. The one is this completeness theorem uh, that Gödel actually smashed in uh, uh, 1931 on this uh, famous uh, conference where, uh, in the honor of Hilbert, actually, because Hilbert was uh, uh, leaving his chair in Göttingen, and this uh, conference was um, uh, organized in the honor of Hilbert. And Hilbert actually didn't attend the, the talk of uh, Gödel, but who attended the talk of Gödel was John von Neumann, who uh, is a student of David Hilbert. And Von Neumann was really a genius of, the, of uh, his time, and he immediately understood that this proof is correct. And uh, shortly after, he even understood that there is another corollary of the first incompleteness theorem, which is the second incompleteness theorem, uh, also um, 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 and I 
speculating another dream or the second question or giving um, a, a, a non-affirmative answer to a second question of Hilbert, which was asking, is arithmetic consistent? So is this set of, for example, the piano axioms that we write to axiomatize arithmetic, is it consistent? And um, uh, von Neumann knew that the, uh, the technique that Gödel uh, used to prove the incompleteness theorem uh, was just a bit uh, further away uh, to, prove the incon to prove that it is impossible to prove inconsistency, to give an, uh, a non-affirmative answer to the consistency question of Hilbert uh, by just changing this sentence of being, uh, which tells about itself, I'm not provable uh, by the axioms of arithmetic into another uh, statement which tells us that we cannot prove consistency of the axioms from within the axioms. And um, when he um, when he got in contact with uh, Gödel, Gödel had already um, understood this consequence that uh, even the dream of consistency that uh, Hilbert had in mind uh, was also smashed. And there was a third question, which is uh, okay. Now we know that our uh, whatever uh, system of axioms, which is um, algorithmic. Uh, cannot be complete if the theory is consistent, and even if the theory is consistent, we will never be able to prove this. Uh, so the last question in uh, Hilbert's um, list was, can I at least decide if um, a statement of interest is true or not? And this, has, this is called the Entscheidungsproblem in German, or the decidability problem, and this is one of the problems that, or this is the last problem that wasn't killed by um, Gödel, but had to wait for Turing. And Turing, after um, uh, um, inventing his notion of computability, like uh, Church and uh, Gödel and uh, Schoenfinkel did before, he introduced the Halter problem. And the Halter problem is another um, impossibility th uh, problem in mathematics that uh, you cannot uh, decide if a computer program will halt on any input. So there is no universal uh, machine so that you can feed it on the one side, the source code of a program, and as a second input, the input to this pro program that you gave as a first argument, and your universal halting machine could decide uh, that uh, the first input, so the program giving and as the first input will halt on the second input, yes or no. And uh, the proof of the halting problem is actually a very simple proof. It's a very shallow proof. You can do this just on two lines if you, uh, if you put all the stuff in place. And um, let me share with you a video. Maybe you can just save the... Um, uh, save the link for afterwards just a moment may i change the link up there yeah yeah go ahead please so how to do this uh edit pinned link yes so this is um, a very nice video which shows you how simple the proof of the um, non-decidability of the halting problem is. So it's a really fairly simple uh, theorem in, on, in mathematics that the halting problem is undecidable and the proof is actually more or less trivial. So uh, the halting problem isn't deep. And uh, it was actually devastating for Hilbert that all his uh, three questions were uh, killed in this way. His last question was um, killed by uh, this halting problem, which is fairly, fairly simple insight. Uh, the insights of Gödel's, of Gödel were deeper, but still some question remained. And uh, the funny thing is that the mathematical com community actually didn't care about uh, all this for some time. And all this came back later 
that uh, the interest in uh, all these decidability or undecidability problem came back with the invention of computers or when computers really took off. But uh, if you look at how mathematics developed, for example, um, in um, the Bourbakis school, actually they didn't even mention the results of Gödel. And they didn't, these results didn't play uh, almost any role in their uh, exposition of mathematics. But of course now they're coming back again and uh, coming strongly uh, when you think about undecidability issues in constructive mathematics. And um, let me then come to the so-called MRDP theorem. So uh, MRDP is uh, is the abbreviation of uh, Matyazevich. M is, stands for Yuri Matyazevich. R stands for Julia Robinson. D stands for Martin Davis. Davis and P stands for Hillary Putnam. And, um, or Putnam, I don't, uh, I'm not exactly sure how, it's, how he's properly pronounced. And um, this uh, theorem is actually deeper than uh, um, the undecidability theorems that I was telling you about before. And it has a very um, uh, intuitive mathematical statements that you can um, communicate to mathematicians, whereas the Gödel incompleteness somehow drifts very quickly into philosophy and people start to say that there are true statements in mathematics which are not provable and uh, of course they don't say anything about that you need that the axioms should be algorithmically um, uh, decidable and they don't say um, uh, anything about actually that this also uh, uh, takes consistency as an assumption and uh, that even the consistency cannot be proved and all these subtleties are, are somehow ignored when you talk philosophically about uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And this is why I actually like much more this theorem of uh, Matyazevich with prior work of uh, Julia Robinson, Martin Davis, and Hilary Putnam, uh, because this is something which is really in arithmetic. So it's not about embedding logic in arithmetic as you needed to do to uh, uh, formulate and prove the Gödel incompleteness, but this is purely about arithmetic. And it's about a very old problem in arithmetic called Diffontine equations. And these are equations that, for example, you encounter um, uh, in um, a Fermat's last theorem. So uh, you uh, know, for example, about the equation x squared plus y squared equals to z squared. Uh, and you know uh, that there are infinitely many solutions called all of them called Pythagorean uh, triples. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Diofontaine produced uh, equations like this, and uh, so so these are uh, multi-variable uh, equations with uh, coefficients in the integers or in the natural numbers. And he asked himself. Uh, are there solutions or how can, how can I find solutions in the integers or the natural numbers of these? And some of them are, of course, uh, very uh, famous, like the one I just said, x squared plus y squared equals z squared, uh, where you have the uh, non-trivial, first non-trivial solution is 3 squared plus 4 squared equals to 5 squared. But if you go and uh, change this equation slightly to uh, x cubed plus y cubed equals to z cubed, then you will figure out that uh, any solution has to, um, uh, for any solution, at least one of the x, y, and z has to be zero. So we say that there are no non-trivial solution to this. This was proved by um, Pierre Fama, and he proved the same thing also for uh, x to the 4 plus y to the 4 equal to z to the 4, that there are no non-trivial solutions. And then he claimed that he have also proved this for n greater or equal to 5, but by now we know that probably his proof uh, was wrong because uh, people afterwards uh, uh, had also uh, what they thought to be a proof, but um, they ended up uh, confusing what we now call irreducible and prime numbers, and uh, that in uh, 
rings of integers, these, these two things at some moment, they diverge. They're not the same notion anymore. So um, it took, um, uh, as you know, um, another uh, uh, 300 years after Pierre Fama until in, I think it was 1993, that Andrew Wiles uh, proved that there are no non-trivial solutions for uh, the Fermat equation x to the n plus y to the n equals to z to the n for n equal to 3. So non-trivial means that none of the x, y, z is equal to 0. So his proof uh, was a sensation when I was still a student. And uh, shortly after, there was uh, a bug in the proof, but two years later, with the help of Richard Taylor, this bug was closed. And this is an indication for something, and this something was already proved uh, 20 uh, years earlier, so actually 1970, that there is no algorithm with which we can decide uh, uh, di the solvability of Diophantine equations. So I cannot write a computer program and give it a Diophantine equation like the equation of Fermat, and it tells me if there are a solution, non-trivial solution, or no solution. And um, the last piece of the puzzle was uh, finalized by uh, Matyazevich, Yuri Matyazevich in 1970, and as I said, he was building on uh, really a big body of work by Julia Robinson, Martin Davis, and Hilary Putnam. And this class of problems is something I really like because this is an undecidability problem which is very concrete. So I can give you um, a family of polynomials just in one parameter, and uh, I think you can write down it in, in nine variables. So, so uh, you can write an equation in nine variables, nine um, uh, indeterminates, and uh, you can parameterize it with one more uh, var variable, which makes the whole thing, again, a polynomial in 10 variables, um, so that you can, for this family, uh, prove that you cannot find an algorithm to decide it for every parameter um, A in the natural numbers. And this is, of course, devastating. So uh, it takes from us a dream that uh, is there since the antique, that very s uh, simple um, um, questions in arithmetic, like the solvability of Diophantine equations. We're not talking about talking about this very awkward sentence that Gödel was trying, that Gödel succeeded in formulating in arithmetic by uh, encoding the liar's paradox in arithmetic. We're really talking about um, very uh, ancient questions um, in mathematics, like the solvability of Diophantine equations. And uh, uh, what uh, the, the four people proved with the last death of Matyazevich, that there is no computer program we can ever write in finite amount of lines that can help us decide Diophantine equations. Never, ever. And uh, shortly after, it was uh, proven that you can use this result, this MRDP theorem, actually to prove uh, a, 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 a concrete form of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So I would say that the MRDP theorem is uh, deeper than, uh, uh, than a certain version of, um, of the Gödel incompleteness. And shortly after, it was even um, uh, clear that you can reformulate completely different questions in arithmetic and um, uh, even in, um, in uh, complex analysis like the Riemann conjecture. So the Riemann conjecture can be reformulated in terms of Diophantine equations. And uh, uh, it is actually astonishing that you can... Uh, write down a Diophantine system in, I think, 2,042 variables, uh, such that if this Diophantine equation has a solution in the natural numbers, then the Riemann conjecture is false. So you can concretely write a system in 2,042 variables. You can write them down. 
and you can ask yourself, can I ever find a solution to this system? And if you find a solution, then you will uh, uh, receive one million dollar because the Riemann conjecture is among the one million dollar, the millennial problem uh, of the Clay Institute. And um, or you can prove that there is no such um, solution in the natural numbers, and then you have proved uh, the Riemann conjecture affirmatively. So it's it's clear how um, um, uh, powerful this statement is. The, the the statement is really telling us something like we cannot hope that we can grasp infinite knowledge just by a finite knowledge. A finite knowledge would be this would be program that could solve all uh, Diophantine equations and the solution of Diophantine equations are always seeked for or looked for in the natural numbers or in the uh, uh, or in the integers. And this story uh, goes a bit uh, further. So one can then ask, what about if I am seeking solution not in the natural numbers or the integers? Uh, seeking a solution in the natural number or the integers is more or less equivalent. But what about if I am seeking solution in the rational numbers? And uh, the funny thing is that this is a wide open problem. We don't know. Colleagues in number theory uh, the ones are, who are studying rationality are exactly trying to find solutions to these things, uh, but we don't know. Maybe, maybe there is an algorithm that would make all these uh, all these efforts obsolete. So we can just plug in a Diophantine equation and let the program run, and if, after a finite amount of time, it can tell us there is a rational solution, yes or no. But what we know for sure is um, by Tars Tarski's theorem that uh, the problem is already decidable over the uh, field of in the field of um, real numbers, and uh, by Grobner bases we know that, uh, or by maybe Chevalier's theorem using Grobner bases we know that um, this uh, question, so the question of solvability of uh, Diophantine equations in complex number or in any algebraically closed field is also decidable. So the problem is somehow related to how small our number domain is. If you're asking about solvability in the natural numbers or in the integers, then we know for sure that this is not decidable. So I think I've talked a lot. Um, maybe there are <laughs> questions. Yeah, uh, that's a great uh, speech. Uh, thanks, uh, yeah, Professor uh, Mohammed. So I think we have lots of questions. Uh, so I'm not sure if Cecil want to ask something. If not, I'll pass back to uh, Mohammed. Thank you. I had a question. I was wondering if you could clarify the distinction between prime and irreducible. Um, yeah, so uh, in general ring theory, you say that uh, something is irreducible. Um, so I I'm now in the domain of rings. Yeah, so you have to know the language of ring theory. You say that um, uh, two elements are associated uh, if they just differ by so called uh, unit, so an invertible element. And irreducible means that. Um, uh, whenever you have a factorization of an element in the ring, uh, then uh, one of the two factors is um, a unit. Yeah, so th there is no non-trivial factorization. This is called irredu irreducibility. So this means that the uh, element you start with is associated to one of the factors because the other one has to be a unit. And prime primality means something different. Um, it, you can uh, uh, um, formulate it in a ring theoretic way by saying that uh, an element is prime if the residue class ring by this element is uh, an integral domain, or you can pose it. Uh, um, so this is a this is the way how I teach it, but you can reformulate it in terms of elements by saying if p divides a product, p, p is called a prime. If p divides a and b, 
then either p divides a or p divides b. And what you can prove if you have the axioms of ring theory that any prime is irreducible, but you will fail to prove the converse because there are counterexamples. And the ring where you can find a counterexample is uh, the ring z adjoined uh, the square root of five. Oh, that's, that's remarkably concise. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, great question. Uh, I will check the Maha and the Ethan uh, if you want to ask anything. I'm, I'm good. This is um, uh, education. I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head around everything. So um, I'll kind of continue listening here. I'm not following the chat. So if there are any questions in the chat. Yeah, I got some question on the chat, but I will just invite them up, uh, yeah, to see if they can explain it. Yeah. Okay, we have a uh, mad hat on the stage. Yeah, so I'll pass mic to you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Mohammed. Thank you for everybody. Uh, actually, I actually have a question, uh, Mohammed. Thank you for the great uh, speech that you gave. Uh, you said that there is no definition for algorithm. I just read, but maybe I'm wrong. There is some kind, some type of definition of algorithm, but use infinity. I don't, I'm not sure if that's correct or not. I mean, I, I mean, I can put it plainly. You can define algorithm if you have like a for loop and while loop. I mean, like, I mean, explicitly if you have like something like more scheme, and like, I mean. Uh, primitive recursive function. I'm not sure if I've, I've got it right or not. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, probably you have a way to convince yourself that you have a formalization of an algorithm. So if you have a, I mean, if you have a Turing machine, you have some sort of formalization. But what we mean is that uh, really something uh, in the language of mathematics, as we do mathematics in this hierarchical way. Uh, we take in mathematics the notion of an algorithm really as primitive. And uh, we are confident that this is good because of the what we now call the Church-Turing thesis. So the Church-Turing thesis is that we have different models of computability. We don't uh, have really a precise definition what is computability and what's not computability, but we have different models and all these models are proven equivalent. So this is a situation which is um, uh, described by the church Turing thesis. And it's for us at the moment um, uh, satisfactory. Yeah. But maybe you can send me the, uh, the stuff you want, you want to send me. But I can tell you that in constructive mathematics, uh, people start with um, with algorithmic simply as a primitive, the notion of an algorithm simply as a primitive notion. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I also have a question. So uh, I think the golden incomplete theory is based on the formal systems, but what's the definition of the formal systems? So, um, uh, formal system is a system in which you can do logic, and uh, you want to have a system which is, of course, strong enough, a formal system which is strong enough so that you can do the proofs that you are used to in arithmetic. And as I said, what Gödel managed to uh, is given the piano axioms or any, uh, any uh, um, axiomatic system which is strong enough to encode arithmetic that he was able to embed the logical formal system into arithmetic so he was able to encode um, any logical statement or the, the calculus of logic inside the calculus of arithmetic so without going much into detail yeah so this is a, a formal system is i would say if, for the people in the room uh, this is a formalization for the usual uh, deduction 
uh, we're do doing daily in mathematics. I see. So uh, I also saw lots of like uh, I'm not sure uh, other explanations about the golden incomplete theory. So people will uh, imply, uh, yeah, people. Some people will say the golden incomplete theory implies uh, some like uh, physics uh, theorems, like the uncertainty uh, in the quantum mechanics. Is that true or? Uh, yeah, in your opinion. I, I'm unaware about this. So uh, when, when I think about uh, Gödel incompleteness, I think about really very com concrete undecidability problems. So I see that Gödel is actually a precursor uh, to uh, what was proved 1970 by uh, Matthias Xavier Trovitz, the Bifis and Putnam. There are very com concrete, very classical historical problems where you don't need to invoke the liar's paradox or any of these things, uh, where we now have a proof that they are undecidable. Yeah. So I can give you a polynomial in nine variables uh, such that if uh, the arithmetic is, in, uh, is if the arithmetic is consistent, uh, then this polynomial has no zero, and I cannot prove this. Yeah. So this is a very concrete statement. I can write you down this polynomial. It has a very high degree. If it's uh, in nine parameters, I can write it, I think, in degree four if I have 58 parameters. But it's in all cases, it's really concrete. Yeah. If you want to make uh, the statement of Gödel concrete, if you want to write really down this arithmetical statement, it will... But about the implication in physics, I'm I'm not aware of this. Okay, thank you. Did you say uh, Gödel's incompleteness or golden incompleteness? Gödel's incompleteness. I'm pronouncing it in the German way. Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Ja, doch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like to make a comment that the. The quantum mechanic uncertainty has nothing to do with Gödel's incompleteness, as far as I know. It's more about the canonical commutation relation. Yeah, this is what I know. I, I, I but I didn't know if, if it has to do with something else. But uh, yes, definitely, it has to do with uh, with the Heisenberg uncertainty principles. I would say it's fair that there are probably theories out there, potentially in quantum gravity, where there is a relationship, but it's not something simple or for this scope. Yeah, uh, I re I'm asking this question because I read some papers, uh, uh, not, not papers, like the articles written by the journalist. So I'm quite, uh, yeah, but I'm not uh, yeah, uh, familiar with the Golden's uh, incompetence series. So glad to see, uh, yeah. Your guys' opinion. So, so the, the one of the goals of this talk is to see that undecidability is everywhere. Yeah? That very classical problems like the solution of De Fontaine equations in the um, natural numbers or in the integers already this is undecidable. You know, and this is really very basic mathematics. And that actually that this result is even deeper than the Gödel incompleteness theorem. Gödel it just was the first one to give us such an undecidable problem. But now we have very concrete problems stemming for, from history, where we now have already proved that there, even these guys are undecidable. Yeah, so the, the message is there is a lot of stuff which is undecidable. You don't need to really embed logic inside arithmetic and to uh, invoke the liar's paradox and so on. Already the Diophantine equations are undecidable if you're searching for solutions in the natural numbers or in the integers. I'd like to ask another question, if I may. Of course. And I apologize if this is a, a bit simple, but um, when you talk about the Gödel's incompleteness theorem, you're always referring to incompleteness as the conclusion. And uh, as I was understanding it, Gödel's incompleteness does not apply to, uh, I guess, pianos, arithmetic without infinity. So for finite rings and, and many cases, 
there is completeness. Um, it, it might also be seen as some kind of argument uh, against infinity. Uh, any thoughts on that? Like, how big can you get in terms of the elements in a set before you encounter uh, incompleteness? No, I, I, th I don't think it's really about uh, this stuff. So, uh, for example, group theory, as I just said, is incomplete. Uh, uh, because of the obvious thing, because you have different models, yeah, and what you can prove is that. Uh, uh, so, what, what of course, what you can do is you can uh, take this statement which Gödel produced, uh, and now it's you know that it is uh, consistent with the piano axioms. You can add it to the piano axioms, right? You cannot. You can neither prove it nor prove its negation. So either this statement or its negation are consistent with piano axioms. So you can add it and get another model of the natural numbers. This is called a non-standard model of the natural numbers. And again, you get uh, you have uh, reduced the uh, set, set of models of the natural numbers by adding one axiom. But still, there are infinitely many inequivalent models of the natural numbers. So there, there again, you have the Gödel theorem applying again. It will. Be, it will succeed in giving you another statement which is not provable from the piano axiom plus the axiom, the additional axiom that you took, and so on. And you can add it, and it's still um, uh, consistent, provided the piano axioms are consistent, and you can go like this forever. So this just tells you that there are certain models. So if you want to talk about arithmetic, this is not algorithmically axiomatizable. Yeah? You cannot just by giving an algorithmic axiomatic system pin down exactly one model of the natural numbers. There will always be infinitely many inequivalent models. And this is why you cannot prove these statements. But the uh, acceptance of infinity is axiomatic itself. So if you reject infinity, then you have a number of valid models, as I understand it, yes? Uh, uh, you don't have infinity in the natural numbers, right? Oh, I thought you did. Um, no. Oh, well. No. I'm the the that. natural numbers do not include infinity. No. Ah, but they include successor function. Yeah. Yeah, but this is not infinity. The successor oh. of one is two, and the successor of two is three, and so on. Ah, that's so the, the cardinality of the natural numbers is infinity, of course. But the yes. natural numbers do not include the number infinity. There is no symbol called infinity in the natural numbers. Is the uh, successor function itself then the issue that leads to undecidability, regardless of the inclusion of infinity within the set? No, no. Uh, there is something called uh, Pressburg arithmetic. I think there you have also the, um, uh, the successor function, and this is a decidable theory. It's a decidable theory of arithmetic, but it's not strong enough so that you can do the trick of Gödel and embed uh, the entire logic inside it. So you won't be able to reproduce the liar's paradox inside and mimic Gödel's proof. Yeah. It's really about the strength of the strength given to, given to you by the piano arithmetic. The piano arithmetic is strong enough to um, to embed the first order logic inside arithmetic. Does this answer your question? Partially, uh, and only for sake of my own ignorance and my help back. So, uh, it's good, good explanation. Yeah, yeah. We, mind, we can. Uh, yeah, I can follow you just a moment, and we can continue discussions. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm undeserving but appreciative. No, I was no, wondering. You're deserving it. Thank you very much for your lovely question. Oh, thank you. If, if you had the time, going into more detail about the ramifications of the incompleteness theorem and the particular aspect of the axioms of piano's arithmetic that arise it, uh, in, in other words, would be helpful for me, because I really could understand this a lot better, I think. Yeah, I think there is a lot I can tell you, but uh, I'm not an expert anymore, but I can give you pointers to a lot of stuff. So I read about them, and I understand them um, in principle, but... Uh, um, I, I can give you pointers if you're interested. I have a lot of pointers. <laughs> but as, as I said, I'm not a logician. I'm just interested in this because of the notion of computability.
Okay, I think Methat has yes. a question. Uh, yes, I have a question. question. Maybe some people, some people say like like the Goldbach conjecture, since yes. a good candidate, good good candidate for I mean, for this incompleteness theory. I mean, it's easier. I mean, it's easier stuff. I mean, to formulate, and uh, yes. an even yes. number which is bigger than two, it's the sum of two primes. Yeah. Two primes. So uh, we don't know if uh, the Goldbach conjecture is, suffers from uh, this. So it might be. That it is so. What is the Goldbach conjecture? The Goldbach conjecture, uh, I think, is telling us that every even number greater or equal to four is the sum of two primes. Yeah. So four is two plus two, six is three plus three, eight is three plus five, ten is five plus five, twelve is uh, five plus seven, etc. Yeah. So, uh, of course, this doesn't need to be unique. At some moment, you will see that there are many possibilities. I think I, I just needed to go to 14 and you would see it, things like this. Yeah. So this could be a candidate, but what the MRDP theorem gave you, it gave you really a statement, which is not so awkward, like this statement of Gödel, yeah, which somehow is hidden in his proof. He's talking about an arithmetic, arithmetical statement encoding the Lyris paradox. But you would look at this, if you really follow the proof into all the details and write down the arithmetical statement, you will say, uh, my God, this is extremely ugly. What would I, why would I ever be interested in uh, uh, answering such, such a statement? But the, the theory of... Uh, um, uh, Putnam, Davis, Robinson, and Matyazevich is really about Diophantine equation, and you can give, uh, you can formulate precise polynomials, where you can prove that there are no, there is no algorithm that uh, can decide this entire one parametric family. You know, I can give you a one parametric family of polynomials, and the parameter is itself polynomial, and there is a proof that there is no computer program that can decide this for any parameter. This is very concrete. Yeah, so yes, th I would say this is a quantum leap. This, leap. this theorem is really a quantum leap um, compared with Gödel's incompleteness. And um, uh, of course, even uh, as I told you, maybe because also something like the Riemann hypothesis is uh, a special instance of uh, the solvability of a very concrete Diophantine equation, maybe this is also one of the problems. So maybe uh, the Riemann hypothesis is undecidable. Yes. Great, thanks. You're welcome. So there are more people on the stage. Just open your mic and uh, uh, comment or ask or whatever you like. Or criticize, of course. So, so I had watched the video and it, it, it was strange how they came to the conclusion at the end that H couldn't exist because the output of H didn't match the total output of X. Yeah. Why? Why? So why, H, should, H, why should? Why should? Why should? Why should? X is no. no wait. So I can have a logic circuit that can have uh, falses within the circuit, but then output a true. That that doesn't prove that the falses within the circuit can't exist. Yeah, but you uh, were able to construct a machine X. Uh, where the uh, predictions of the oracle H is always wrong, you know? So you were able to construct, so given H, you constructed another machine called X, which simply contradicts everything which the oracle is saying. If the oracle is saying this machine will halt, the machine will not halt and vice versa. So, but that, so that, that's cannot the function be such of the an end, oracle. Right, the, the, the end, the negator, the, the, the or... Yeah, right exactly. Yeah, this right. is yeah. This is the trick with the negator at the, at the end. Yes. So, so what, what? But but that's you know plugging in another circuit doesn't prove the circuit before it wrong. No, but it proves that you cannot have such an oracle. 
right? No. Okay, then you have to elaborate. I, 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 so I'm not saying that such an oracle can exist. What, what, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is the proof that the oracle can't exist what, what was not satisfactory within the video. I see. Yeah. So this, uh, there are other proofs. So this is the uh, the proof that at least convinced me. Um, I have another proof, but uh, I wasn't able to find. Uh, so there is, of course, a more elaborate proof than the one that I learned. But I wasn't able to find it um, somewhere so that people can uh, uh, can quickly um, go over it. But um, I think this proof really uh, tells the essence. Uh, maybe I need more criticism from you. So Machine X is a duplicator um, going into a testing bed going into an inverter, right? Um, inverting the testing bed result does not, uh, it, it does not speak to the, the um, functioning of the testing bed, right? So, so if, if I invert every single response that you give me, Right. And, and, and say, oh, you said yes. Therefore, I'll say no. Right. That doesn't make you wrong. That, that, that just means that there's a that, that I'm outputting the opposite of you. The, 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 the third component in that machine is no, no, just it, it will not. No, no, it will not say wrong. It will run forever. It will not invert. You know, it will simply not halt. But you've created a halting machine that that on on half of the outputs of H will halt, right? So so H isn't halting still. A, H is it, H is still pumping out the result every single time. There there's not a point at which H does not feed a result into N. Exactly yes. H is an oracle that knows so, so everything. H, it always so, answers so H, yes, right. So, so H hasn't done anything like, like you, you don't judge H on the output of X. Yeah. But, uh, I think what, what should be said is that X should not answer no, but it should, um, run into an infinite loop. So when X, when, when H says it will halt, the negator at the end should run into an infinite loop. It shouldn't just say no, it wouldn't halt. It should run into an infinite loop. But that's not how that was set up, right? If if uh, if H feeds out um, no halt, then uh, N halts. If H feeds out halt, then N doesn't halt. Yes, yes, we agree. Okay, but but how is the output of N have any bearing? on h yeah because okay, let's let's forget x for a moment yeah and, and 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 talk about these components as they are you have the duplicator which is you know non-issue yes, um exactly. you, you have h right yes. which, which is printing so, out a halt or a not halt every single time yeah, yeah. and then so, and then you have a machine that's you know fault fault so at, at, at the end Yes, X is fed its blueprint, right? For, and, for, for, um, forget X. Uh, just just think about the the things in series, right? Uh, you you've got the duplicator, you've got the 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 uh, the, the fault tolerant computer, and and and, and uh, fault yeah fault tolerant computer, yeah. and then you have the fault intolerant one, yeah. right? So so the fault tolerant computer. Never, never messes up. There, there, there's no point at which H fails. Correct. Exactly. It's just, it's our oracle. It's our halting oracle. Would be halting oracle. Yes. It, it's just connected to a failing device. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. That 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 doesn't bear on H's results. That that, that doesn't bear on H's output. No, no. Right. But but what we are feeding inside X is its own blueprint, including this 
uh, the gator at the end, the one that uh, can decide to run into an infinite loop. This is part of the input that X is fed with. But but why are you looking at X? Because I want to construct an, an X. I want to construct a machine that is uh, um, proving me that H is wrong. But, 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 I'm but that, using that H has to construct another machine to, to prove me that the predictions of H are wrong. But you haven't proved that H is wrong. You've proved that X is wrong. No, X is not wrong. X is just a machine that either halts or doesn't halt. And it, its behavior of halting and non-halting is exactly vice versa to what H is predicting. But H is never a halting, right? When, when, you, when you break it out into yeah. the components, H never yes. halts. It's just connected to a machine that is halting. That, that's, that, yes. that's, not, that's, not H, that's not H being in fault. You're, you're, yeah. you're, adding, you're adding a component to H that is fault intolerant. Hmm. So I, I don't understand your point, but maybe you can give another simple proof. You know, there are simple proofs of, uh, of the halting problem, right? Do you, do you have one on the top of your mind? I don't. Okay. Is it possible to hypothesize the existence of an addition that would just be the solution to the halting problem as an additional axiom and then discuss uh, how it would differ from existing arithmetic? That might be a stretch. You, 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 you add another machine to it. So, so if the whole thing starts shaking it, it outputs yes. And if it doesn't shake, then it outputs no. That's a fairly plausible way to do it. Okay, more questions? Prompt, I'll follow you so that we can also take the discussion offline. Okay, more questions? I have a question. Uh, I have, uh, or actually, Ned Hat, you go ahead. No, I will ask about some different matter. So if I'm interrupting the current discussion, so maybe I'll be interrupting. I don't know if you're finished with the question because I'll ask something completely different. I'll ask a question, and then it's up to Muhammad if he wants to spend more time on this. Uh, I have a, a little bit of uh, trouble encapsulating the logic in my mind about the uh, Godel's incompleteness proof because his mapping of arithmetic uses uh, the symbols that it does for uh, dealing with base 10 arithmetic and the familiar things. And I was wondering if there was a simpler formulation using more Boolean logic um, actually, he's using prime numbers. He's, so his Gödel numbers are really using the encoding. So you, you're giving the prime numbers. You're using actually the fact that uh, the monoid of that the multiplicative monoid of natural numbers is infinitely generated. Uh, it's generated by all the primes. And I think this is the arithmetical trick he's using. It's uh, completely independent of the base you're, uh, you're using. That I understand. I was just wondering if somebody had expressed it uh, in uh, lower base primalities. It might make more sense then. I, I see um, what's being uh, done using I, I think you... and exponentiation to create unique solutions to any input. And so yeah. you know there's halting. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, if, it, if it was expressed somewhere and had a name that I could read it, uh, where it's in, like, base 2. Um, it's just, uh, I think you can write it also in base 2. So, as far as I remember, the, instead of saying 7, you can write it in, uh, in binary. It, uh, it doesn't make any difference. So the trick, the trick uh, that he's using is completely independent of uh, writing down the numbers as decimals or non-decimals. I think you can redo the entire proof with a, in a complete different, a completely different basis. That is my understanding as well. I was just wondering if somebody had already done that no, for me, so no, I could go look at no, it. No, you, right. your question is probably heading: Would the proof be more clear, or uh, would be more insightful? But I don't think so. The, the statement that he is proving is arithmetically still awkward. So 
Sebastian Ahmed hat? Uh, yes, um, I have a, we had a discussion some days ago about the continuity hypothesis, if it is an example of the uh, Gödel incompleteness theory. And uh, some people were saying, no, it's not an example. And I think it's an example. Uh, uh, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would say uh, it is an example, yes. I mean, you have uh, the zermelo frankel with choice. This is even stronger than piano. And um, Gödel, in its general form, tells you any system which is strong enough to encode arithmetic uh, will be incomplete if it is consistent. If it's inconsistent, of course, you can prove anything because you can derive false, and from false, you can derive anything. And um, um, so it is an instance here. Yeah. And uh, this is why you can either take the continuum hypothesis, which is by now proven to be... Uh, to be independent, you can either add it to the axioms or you can um, add its negation to the axioms and branch from this point. So you would have two different mathematics. Yes, exactly. That was my position. And I have a, another question. If you add the infinity, I mean, to the axioms, I mean, the ZFC has already, I mean, the axiom of infinity. Uh, you can still, I mean, apply, if you have a, a proof, which you, this, you can also construct I mean, infinities, if you, if you add the infinity as an axiom. I mean, the FC has an infinity axiom. As, as I know, the Van Neumann construction of the ordinal numbers, you this also as well. Uh, so my question is, if you use the transfinite numbers, uh, I mean, the system as, as such would, would be still such as algorithmic, or it or can be algorithmic because if you use transfinite numbers. Do you get my question? Or? Uh, not really. So what I know is that inside inside uh, uh, set theory, uh, or if, if you fix uh, zermelo Franco, then you can prove that you have exactly one uh, one model of the natural numbers. So you don't suffer from this branching and branching of if you start with piano. This is a theorem uh, that goes back to Dedekind. It's called the universality theorem. Uh, but I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, I mean, the uh, ZFC, I think there are seven axioms, or I don't know about the number of the axioms. And one of yeah, them, nine, uh, one of the depending axioms, on the counting, yes. Uh -huh. And one of them says there is, it's called the infinity axiom, which says, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so some, you can have a set which is like uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatsoever, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. empty, or empty set, and whatsoever. So, I mean, one axiom, mm -hmm. uh, one axiom says we, has, we have already an infinite set in our mm -hmm. system. So if you can drive, I mean, uh, statements, which I mean, I mean, uh, as, I, as I understand, maybe I can, later, maybe I can send you some video. Um, I mean, they say, I mean, you can construct the ordin ordinal numbers. I mean, as it's called the phonem phonemic construction of ordinal, num of ordinal numbers based on, uh, I mean, this uh, axiom. Yeah, the, you, you, I see. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you're using infinity as an axiom, can you still this in an algorithmic way, even if you use to transfer that number in the algorithm? Um, I think you have to ask other people who are working on uh, on these constructive aspects. Um, okay. Yeah, there is there are so-called uh, a theory of searchable sets and uh, decidable sets and a, a lot of work which I'm not really aware of because it's not uh, at all touching my work. So infinity is not necessarily, or let's say unboundedness, is not necessarily uh, violating uh, uh, computability. Okay. Let's put it this way. Yeah, okay, that's not a question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thanks for all the great questions. So I think uh, we have uh, some questions from the chat. So uh, one audience is asking uh, if Gödel's incomplete theorem uh, precludes the existence of the grand unified theory. In, in physics, you mean? Uh, yes. Um, I, don't know. I, I don't see the connection, actually. So, uh, I mean, mathematics exist and number theory exists, although we cannot uh, uh, decide 
uh, solvability of the Alphantine equations. But the theory is going on. It's just the statement that uh, we cannot encode infinite knowledge, so, so genuinely infinite knowledge, with finite knowledge. This is how I understand uh, these undecidability statements. Yeah, so we cannot hope that we can write a finite program that answers infinitely or genuinely infinitely different problems. Yeah. So yeah, what are a good point. Uh, I'll go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, um, and I, I apologize if I'm just falling into my own kind of trapped on a particular topic here thing, but uh, what about something like the uh, Fibonacci numbers, or, or even more simply the rabbit sequence, which is a pathological example of a nearly symmetric but not symmetric uh, string, uh, where it's constantly generating a new, unique uh, result that is not uh, containing uh, a complete repetition of itself. So we know it never loops, and it comes from a simple construction. And it's not the prime numbers but it does seem to generate a unique output uh, at every step. And you can compute uh, any uh, moment in it with a simple uh, formula using C, but you can't actually, you know... And a formula using the, the formula. golden ratio, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And I guess better way to put it is, does Godel's incompleteness relate to the golden ratio in any way? I notice the number five pops up as one of the examples, and that certainly does. Five being the size of the ring. Uh, Chris, is that a question or a comment? I, I'm sorry, Mama. I was uh, I was speaking and my mic was closed. Ah. So uh, I don't know who, uh, how, um, when did I uh, close my mic my microphone again, but I was telling you that. The, um, Fibonacci numbers played a role in the proof of Matyazevich. So this final step that I told you about, uh, that uh, he finalized the proof of the matyazevich robinson davis putnam theorem, uh, there the uh, Fibonacci numbers played a crucial role. And uh, I can tell you a bit more, and then I can uh, um, give you references. So uh, what Robinson, Davis, and Putnam established before is a description of uh, of uh, what they call Diophantine sets, but what we would call today exponentially Diophantine sets. So these are uh, sets described by projections of uh, polynomial systems where you allow allow some of the exponentials, um, some of the ex some of the indeterminates be replaced by their exponential two to the x you know, or two to the xi. And uh, what he proved is that. Um, uh, that y equals, so the solution of y equals 2 to the x in, in the integers is also Diophantine. So he could get rid of the exponentials in their argument and come back to a classical Diophantine equation. And for this, he uh, used uh, ideas coming from the Fibonacci sequence. Yeah. Um... Um, I'm yeah, sorry, I was uh, not having a good signal, so I did not hear all of your presentation, but um, um, I think Shara asked a little bit earlier about uh, some prob um, Goodell's um, incompleteness theorem as related to physics problems. Um, I saw some of this and maybe it's not for today, but I will just maybe send you some links about examples of physics problems that they associate with the Goodell's, in Goodell's incompleteness theorems, like for example, and the stability of the spectral gap. So yeah, maybe that's a discussion for next time. Yeah, 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 definitely. I, I wouldn't be astonished if there are such links. I mean, uh, what I was trying to say today is that uh, already these undecidability problems are fundamental in mathematics, and it's uh, not really just good, but uh, very concrete problems in mathematics are undecidable. And this is even deeper than uh, good as undecidability. So the undecidability is everywhere. So I wouldn't be surprised at all that they pop up uh, even in problems in physics. 
yeah, I think, you know, uh, people who are not exactly deep into the field will have more appreciation of uh, the contribution of, uh, contribution of Goethe LEI if they, uh, they try to relate that to other fields. So, yeah, thank you. I just want to ask if we can invite you in the future again, you know, to talk um, about about other topics in mathematics. It, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, I, I can tell you more about computer algebra, but I don't think that people are so interested in computer algebra. I think uh, this good incompleteness and the whole thing, and uh, maybe, maybe even MRDP is not really uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, well known. So um, I was taking it somehow, so I was uh, trying really to make the connection to something deeper in mathematics, which is, which is not really uh, as well known as Gödel incompleteness. And I think Gödel inco is, incompleteness is, um, is well known because it's usually misquoted. It's misquoted in a funny way, like uh, things like there are provable things in mathematics that there are true things in mathematics that we will never be able to prove. And, you know, that things drift quickly into, uh, into this very philosophical, um, uh, misquoted sentences, and this uh, gives the whole topic uh, a bit of obscurity. But actually, it's much more concrete than this. There are in undecidable, undecidable problems everywhere in mathematics. So nowadays, we don't need Gödel to tell us that there are undecidable problems everywhere. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you for an outstanding session. I really learned a lot. Thank you so much. My question is, um, is this related to Wolfram's uh, computational irreducibility? Um, let me think. Um, um, in some way, of course. I mean, he's talking about... Um, no, I, I have to think. I have to think and maybe we can talk in another meeting but uh, so he's taking he's taking anyway a, a computational model of the universe and this will uh, suffer from all problems of um, of decidability yeah so he's using a turing machine and his model is not a hyper computational model but a computational model and because of this he'll run into all sorts of undecidability so there will be problems like everywhere like I just showed, they're, they're actually everywhere, these undecidable problems in mathematics, and he will be running into this. Yeah, there will be problems he cannot decide uh, with a universal pr uh, program. Uh, but le let me say again, so it, it doesn't mean, when, when we say that uh, 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 Diophantine equations are undecidable, it just means there is not one algorithm, one oracle for all of them. But it might be very well the case that for every instance that you're looking at, you will find a program. And if you add all these programs up, they will be infinite. You know, then this is this is not Turing machine anymore because it will need infinite amount of code to answer infinite amount of problems. And what people in number theory are doing is they're taking certain classes of Diophantine equation and solving them concretely, like uh, what happened with, uh, with Fermat's last theorem. This was a Diophantine equation, and it was proven to be unsolvable. Yeah? So uh, it's, only the, it's only the statement, you don't have an oracle, a finite oracle for everything. Taken literally, um, doesn't that also simply say infinity might not exist? I don't really see the, the relation. So um, you could have an infinite all, all, all oracle this, for everything. And so I, I would I would say the, this just says that if your model of computation is Turing, a Turing machine, then you will run into all these undecidability problems. If you have an infinite machine, if you would have a, a resource in the nature for hypercomputation, you can decide uh, a lot of these problems. So I would say it's the lack of 
the infinity you cannot compute infinitely long you you are you are really bound to uh to turing machines even if they have an infinite tape but they run uh, cycle by cycle you cannot really compute infinitely many steps at once so actually it's the lack of infinity which is causing the undecidability problems mm. i agree i also wanted to uh personally thank you for such a wonderful lecture and also um i would love to hear more about computational algebra personally so thank you again and thank you're you. welcome thank you for respecting my awkward questions as well no, they're I'm very interested but nothing, ignorant nothing awkward oh, about thank you yes thank you uh so much i also learned a lot since i'm new to this uh field so uh regarding to the imrdp theorem uh yeah it's not well known uh but what's the deeper uh deeper meaning for that uh yeah that's my question what's the deeper meaning of the mrdp yeah theorem? yes why you think that's more important compared to the other theorem because uh, uh, because you can yeah. prove yeah because you can prove good out of this and you can phrase things like the riemann hypothesis as a, a diophantan equation yeah so you can write down a concrete polynomial in a lot of variables i think uh, 2042 uh such that this polynomial uh has a solution if and only if the 1 million dollar uh riemann problem uh is wrong is false yeah so th oh, this is really research. deep yeah it's really deep and you don't have anything uh similar in the in the godel world so godel struggled to give us really a an awkward statement that is encoding the liars paradox in arithmetic and the mrdp theorem is just fantastic this is something much deeper yeah i would like to see if we have some reference uh, i tried to search but i didn't find out the yeah some uh, useful reference but i will check with you offline yeah it's called uh, um i think if you just type mrdp then you will find the the wikipedia page and i can send you some articles of matthias evich himself and of jones and other people so i don't know if i answered paul's question in a proper way uh but we can continue discussion anyway <laughs> and uh um. I was going yeah. to ask about uh, trying to better understand Diophantine equations. It seems as though uh, it's related to right triangles in as much as uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared is an example of a Diophantine equation. And there you're uh, giving the specific root for uh, two integer sides. The hypotenuse is the solution. and then extending that to additional polynomials would be like raising the dimensionality of it so like finding yeah. the diagonal of a cube no, uh, t yeah no it, you can take more more variables x y z w something you can so you can you don't have a bounded number of of, uh, of indeterminates and you can go up with the coefficients so for example in the in this uh, x squared plus y squared equals z squared all your coefficients are 1 but you can put in arbitrary coefficient you can say 301 times x to the 7 minus 5 uh, y to the 6 uh, plus uh, 1 million z to the 2000 equals w uh, to the 3 minus z to the i don't know to the quintillion yeah something like this yes so all the, all these are diophantine equations yes. and my question is just to to double check that the geometric intuition for finding the root of the diagonal in uh a, a, a some dimension is uh equivalent to the diophantine equation uh so for every know. additional x y z w with integer valued uh coefficients the diophantine is the solution to the unique root no it's the roots are not unique uh, as you know from the 
from the Pythagorean numbers. Oh. For example, uh, yeah. you, you know that, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, but but I can give you other uh, equations. Um, I can give you a talk I gave about this, uh, where there are equations where we don't know if the so we found a solution, but we don't even know if it's unique or not. And uh, the smallest solution is really small. The next solution is humongous. So the next triple. Uh, is something so let, uh, maybe I can find the talk here yeah for example yeah the solution to x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equal to 3 yeah so again x cubed plus y cubed equals plus z cubed equal to 3 so uh, of course you can take the solution 1 1 1 so 1 cubed plus 1 cubed plus 1 cubed is equal to 3 and then the second uh, small solution is 4 cubed plus 4 cubed plus minus 5 cubed is equal to 3. So this is 64 plus 64 minus 125. This is 3. And then people were asking, uh, is, it, is this everything? And the answer is no. They found another one which has, I think, 21 digits. Uh, I will send it to you. So this is how many digits? 21. Yes. X has 21 digits, Y has 21 digits, and Z has 18 digits. That's a bit of a leap. Yeah, a bit of a leap, yes. <laughs> and it's not known if there is something in between. I would appreciate any additional geometric uh, interpretations because uh, I have a much better mind for understanding and visualizing uh, geometries, even if it goes up into higher dimensions, versus uh, algebraic expressions. Uh, can you speak to yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, you, if you look at any system of Diophantan equations and you interpret it, I don't know, in the complex numbers or in the real numbers, and this is defining a real algebraic manifold. Yeah, and then you're asking, is my real algebraic manifold intersecting my standard lattice? Yeah, so you can think of it geometrically. You can go to the real numbers, and there you know that you can decide it because the arithmetic complexity of the real numbers is is low. You have the theorem of Tarski. You can prove that uh, any system of equations, you can decide if it has solutions or not. You can even decide the dimensionality of the variety that you're system is uh, defining in the real numbers in real coordinates but then you can ask is my variety avoiding all integer lattice points yes or no you know ah uh, okay yeah that's what i was thinking earlier when i expressed it as like the solution to the hypotenuse or the root yeah uh, even though yeah. the root would have two solutions or uh, possibly more uh, it would be falling on the lattice point if it was the root okay cool yeah Exactly. Yeah. For example, the the uh, Pythagorean uh, Pythagorean numbers x squared plus y squared equal to z squared. You can. This is just a hypersurface defined by x squared plus y squared minus z squared. Yeah. This is a very simple uh, uh, hyperboloid, and uh, uh, it uh, it's intersecting the integral lattice at many points. These are called the uh, Pythagorean numbers. Oh, that's, that's a revelation. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, that's awesome. So I will double check with Paul to see if uh, yeah he's satisfied with the answer and if he has some more follow-up questions. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm fairly happy. Um, Mohammed and I are going to talk about this offline. Um, there's lots of interesting topics that spin off this, which I really enjoyed and I'm looking forward to future sessions. So I'm happy that um, Mohammed's uh, answer to my question was actually quite good. Um, I think it was quite concise and uh, was appreciating it. The one thing I would possibly ask as a second question is I'm a little bit aware from the audiences I've had in my room that sometimes it's really useful to um, to define some things. And one of the things I noticed is that uh, we we talked about groups and um, and then we talked about the language of rings, but but Mohammed, you didn't really say much about rings. So, so maybe you could explain to the audience here what the language of rings is. Yeah. So, uh, uh, if you're coming from category theory, I can tell you a ring is a, a monoid object in the category of abelian groups. <laughs> but otherwise.
size, it's uh, it's a set having two um, operations, one called the plus and one called the times. Uh, together with the plus, it's an abelian group. And together with the times, it's uh, a monoid, such that there you have the uh, a certain compatibility between these two operations, which is the distrib distributivity law. So you have the axioms that A times B plus C is A times uh, B plus A times C. And if you put A on the other side, you get the corresponding right-handed axiom called the right distributivity law. So this is then B plus C in brackets times A is equal to B times A plus C times A. And this is the interweaving of the two uh, of the two operations on the ring. Yeah. And if uh, the uh, multiplication uh, is uh, commutative, so if the uh, if AB equals to BA for all pairs, then you call the ring commutative. And uh, if the all elements except zero, together with the multiplication, form uh, a group. Uh, then you're talking about a so-called uh, division ring. And if this group is commutative, you co you call it a field. For example, like the field of rational numbers or the field of uh, real numbers or the field of complex numbers. But uh, a genuine example of a ring uh, is the ring of of the integers. And a counterexample to, the, to a ring is the, are the natural numbers because you don't have an additive inverse. So the the uh, natural numbers together with plus, they give you a monoid, but they don't give you a group because you don't have an you don't have minus one in the natural numbers. So the natural numbers would be semi-ring. The uh, integers would form a ring, and uh, the rational numbers would be even a field. So it's a ring with an extra property. So these are the basic, very basic examples. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Hansen, who joined us lately. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, 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 I actually read some time ago, before the uh, Fermat's uh, last theorem was proved, uh, there was also a uh, uh, something, I, I don't know, it, maybe it's a conjecture or something, that the it is um, somehow related to the uh, Godos in, in, in completeness theorem. The uh, uh, something about the uh, undecidability on the uh, Fermat's last theorem. Uh, do, you, do you have you have you read um, about it uh, before? Uh, I'm not sure whether that's a, kind of a definitive statement or. Uh, uh, or something, but uh, yeah, um, th does it ring a bell? So, what was the statement that uh, the uh, proof of the of Fermat's last, last theorem might depend on the axioms or something like this? Yeah, so something might be undecidable. You, you, yes, yes, you because you what uh, reminded me of this was uh, uh, your previous statement uh, relating to, relating the uh, Dufantin's. Um, uh, equation to the yeah, uh, Riemann's yeah. uh, conjecture. So uh, yeah. kind of remind me of this this thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is definitely a De Fontaine equation uh, per definition, and it could have been very well the case that it is undecidable in piano arithmetic or anything that you build upon it. Yes. Yes, but we now have a proof that there are no solutions. So we now know that it is decidable. Cool, cool. Uh, the proof is uh, the proof was, uh, as you know, is a quite complicated proof and, and uses a lot of non-constructive mathematics. And yeah. it's not clear if if all this mathematics can be made constructive or not. Yeah, it's, uh, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's in any way it's um, uh, so constructive mathematics isn't really a problem if you're proving the non-existence. You know, constructive mathematics is only, uh, so I'm sorry, non-constructive mathematics or classical mathematics is only problematic if you use it to prove existent results because it doesn't give you a certificate, it doesn't give you something. You know, it tells you something exists, but you don't have a construction 
because it's a non-constructed mathematics. But um, uh, here it's about a non-existent theorem. So in this sense, it is okay. I don't know if you can still hear me or not. <laughs> I can repeat it after you come back. Yeah, uh, great questions. So at the same time, uh, we have another follow up questions regarding the uh, good uh, complete incomplete theorem and the grand unified theorem. So the question is, uh, if the grand uh, unified theorem exists, does that mean the universe is not equivalent to the infinite knowledge? Or uh, does the if not, does that mean the grand unified theory cannot be exist? I, I really don't see the connection because, I mean, you can write down equations and the equations will, solving the equations will suffer from the same problems we have here in mathematics. So you can write an equation, but you won't be able to find solutions or decide the existence of solutions. So... Um, um, and when I, when I we hear a grand unified theory, I just hear a grand unified theory about the stuff we know, uh, we observe in the world. And this is, of course, finite. So we have no idea what is the, the, the ground truth. We're not really talking about the ontological truth here. We're just talking about the stuff we observe, the four uh, forces we're observing and uh, I don't see any problem in uh, any logical problem in having a theory unifying all this to some precision. Uh, even if you inside this theory, for, for example, when you search for solutions, I don't know, maybe the, the theory tells you that you have to search for some integral solutions for uh, Diophantine equations, then you will run into the undecidability problems. But still, you can have the equation. You know, like we had the, for a long time the, the Fermat equations, and we just didn't know if they're solvable or not. Yeah? Now we know for sure since 1995 that they are not, not solvable, at least uh, not non-trivially solvable. So I don't, I don't really see the connection why, um, why Gödel or any other undecidability problems uh, tell you that there is no theory. It tells, for me, it tells me that Maybe we can find a theory, but solving or answering questions in this theory might be um, undecidable. Yeah, good point. I hope this answers the question. Uh, yeah, Hansen, you want to comment? Yeah, just a, a short question. I think um, you probably have answered it uh, earlier. Uh, so uh, I just read from the... Uh, um, the comments that um, the uh, from the comments that the uh, uh, infinite uh, cannot infinity can cannot be genuinely described by a finite number. I suppose that uh, uh, rigorously defined. I'm uh, just wondering. So basically, let's say the uh, method of induction, uh, which is which is uh, isomorphic to the natural number, uh, is is not classified as uh, uh, genuinely infinite. Is, is that correct? Yeah, so genuinely infinite is my, my word. I want to have some sort of mental understanding of what these things are uh, uh, epistemically saying. What is the statement? And for me, it's clear we have very different... So when, you, when you're a number theorist and working on these... Uh, on these Diophantine equations, really every di sort of Diophantine equation, it's a new game, you know? A new game, new experts, new expertise, new theories, people. When you see how people are looking at Diophantine equations, you really understand that uh, y y you have a, a, um, uh, an expectation that because of these people are s using so genuinely different approaches, to look at certain classes of Diophantan equation, it's actually inconceivable that at one point we could find an algorithm, a finite, a finite procedure that will make all this obsolete, that could decide this in, uh, in a finite amount of time. You know, 
And for me, all these different, uh, uh, although they are all Diophantine equations, but the theory of solving them or attacking them uh, are different because these these Diophantine equations are genuinely different. You know, this is why you need really different theories to tackle them. And uh, uh, the statement of uh, of Matyazevich is um, actually um, uh, ensuring us that. The Fontaine equation is broad enough that there are genuinely infinite number of different problems inside this scope. So we have no hope, and this is proven, there cannot be a finite procedure that can solve all this. Yeah? And this is what I mean by genuinely infinite. Speaking to uh, the Diophantine equations as relating to uh, solutions falling onto a lattice, uh, and stepping back from decidability, like not, not to argue with the incompleteness of the Diophantine equation sets, what can be said about the, any relationships within the, the different uh, types of Diophantine problems? Are there certain uh, equations that are uh, having solutions and other equations that are not, that's in some particular pattern? What can be said about the approach towards undecidability among the different Diophantine equations? Um, very different. So we know, for example, that uh, uh, if you bound the degree to two, then you can solve things. Yeah, I think uh, this goes back to Hasse. And if you just have two variables, then you have a decision problem. And uh, But for example, the people who are working on uh, elliptic curves, yeah, which are now used in cryptography. They're really searching for rational solution. This, it's not then the, the integral solution, but rational solution of elliptic curves. And the, these are given in maybe three variables. And this is a deep, deep theory where you can win uh, big prizes in mathematics. Yeah. Okay, and or already, already, this is a profession. Just to be uh, to talk about rationality of some class of curves, and if the genus of the curve, the elliptic curves, are of genus one, if you go to genus two or genus three, then you need a completely different sort of expertise, you know. And you're still talking about rational points of uh, some curve defined by a single equation in three variables. It's amazing. I love to visualize things in terms of lattices because I think of the lattice as kind of like the path to the solution. Like what steps along the lattice do you take to reach the solution? And if no sequence of steps can be given, then there is no solution. And uh, yeah, simply with uh, that simple a curve uh, that we base our entire economic system on there being no solution is pretty astounding. Right. Yeah, so um, l let me iterate, there is no oracle. Yeah, this doesn't mean that problems are not solvable. So maybe for every class of Diophantine equation, you have to come up with really new, genuine knowledge. Yeah, the only thing is you cannot hope because it doesn't exist, you cannot hope for one procedure that solves everything. So this uh, existence of some uh, source of information, is that prohibited mathematically? Uh, maybe it's slightly outside, outside the scope of uh, Grodel's, but in relationship to like the golden ratio has some pretty interesting properties, once again, to raise it. Um, could it act as some sort of oracle with respect to these Diophantine equations? I'm not sure I... Uh, understood your question? Um, no, I don't think I can uh, describe it clearly enough, so it's probably not worth answering. Yeah, maybe you can think of it and we can continue discussion about it later. Yeah, that's proper. <laughs> Good. More questions? So the non-existence of a uh, general finite step algorithm 
uh, is the statement of the uh, statement of the MRDP here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. But still, you see, the this was known, but the behavior of mathematicians uh, was. We will continue trying to find for the Fermat uh, Fermat equations to find the proof that uh, they are only trivially solvable. So all these non-decidability uh, 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 results do not hinder mathematicians from exploration. It's just telling us that uh, we cannot. Uh, uh, there is no hope that with one theory we can um, get all the results. Yeah, for every sort of class of problems, we have to invent a new theory. Yep, yep, uh, very clear, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, great questions. Uh, thanks for all the uh, interesting discussion. Uh, also, thanks, uh, uh, Mohammed. Mo Mo so it's really a fascinating talk. I learned a lot. So, uh, we are almost reaching two hours mark. So I will check with the audience and uh, speakers here if you want to ask your last minute question or share your closing thoughts. So. I guess we are trying to uh, respect uh, the professor's time, and but we are looking forward to deliver the next session with more interesting topics, maybe in the computing uh, algebra and so much more. Just a quick question. <laughs> um, so um, I am sure that the, yeah, the proof of the um, MRDP um, theorem is uh, uh, very complicated. Um, just uh, kind of a like the most uh, simplistic way abstract uh, uh, kind of a stupid question I guess the uh, does it involve so the, anything, the idea of the proof yes it, does it involve anything like the uh, diagonalization idea that Kant used to prove the uh, uncountability of the uh, real number uh, the diagonal, no, yeah, nothing like yeah, that, right? in some sense that, um, so it was proved by uh, Matyazevich uh, that um, the so-called Diophantine sets, which I didn't uh, define, these are sets which are projections of, Diophant of solutions of Diophantine equations to uh, uh, smaller dimensions or up to certain axes of the uh, of your coordinate systems uh, that these uh, sets are exactly the same as what is called in computability recursively enumerable sets and we know that there are recursively enumerable sets which are not recursive and for this we use all the stuff that you just mentioned for example we use uh, the undecidability of the halting problem, which also can use diagonal arguments and et cetera, et cetera. So at, in, in, the, in the part where we say there, uh, that Diophantine sets are the same as recursively enumerable, uh, then the undecidability is exactly the proof that we have recursively enumerable sets, which are not recursive sets. Yeah? And this is uh, exactly your point, yeah? where these diagonal arguments might, get, might sneak in again. Great, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, thanks for Hansen's question. Okay, I will mute you. Uh, uh, and we have, maybe we can uh, have one last question. So this question is from the chat. So uh, audience asking uh, if, um, yeah, so if the golden uh, in complete theory prove that our brains will not be able to solve every problem since the brains probably confide to the finite algorithm. Thank you. Um, I think our brains are Turing machines and as strong as Turing machines. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think that uh, our brains can do anything more than Turing machines in this sense. Uh, 
yes. Um, but I'm um, maybe there is a resource a resource in nature which is hyper computational. I don't uh, I don't know of it. Of course, I would be very interested because it will help me solve a lot of computer algebra problems. But I'm not waiting for it. And uh, I don't know. Also, you have to give me a problem. Uh, that uh, computers can do or and people cannot and uh, vice versa I think uh, that uh, this will gradually converge so in the sense uh, that uh, our, our brains are human machines yeah but uh, this is another topic this is this I have no proof of this uh, what I ask uh, kind of an application or the, the ut utility uh, question so, uh, have you heard of Lean, L-E-A-N, yeah. uh, software? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, first question is, have you used it, and how how do you find it? Is it is it uh, effective, efficient? And second, uh, the uh, what uh, what what is your favorite uh, computational algebra? I mean, uh, software uh, that you found most most useful. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So Lean is a very modern proof assistant. Uh, it has a classical logic wired in. So uh, as I said, I'm a constructive mathematician. I'm. Uh, I want to do mathematics that has uh, uh, interpretation in algorithms, and Lean is more uh, a proof assistant for classical mathematics. Uh, I like classical classical mathematics. I'm not refuting it, but uh, for my work it's only useful for non-existence result but for existence result i'm i'm a guy who is producing algorithms so i cannot use existence by contradiction uh, so if some classical mathematician tells me i have an existence proof the first question i ask him is it uh, again a proof by contradiction if he says yes I'm, i tell him i'm sorry this is for me worthless and uh, lean is a very modern system where uh, it's geared towards proofs in classical mathematics and it has a lot of uh, knowledge how to bypass the shortcomings of older systems. Um, um, and it has a very, uh, very nice uh, uh, syntax. And it uh, tries to be as intuitive as possible, although it is, of course, a formal system. Uh, but this is a computer algebra. This is a proof assistant. It's not even a theorem prover. It doesn't try to prove, at least as far as I know it. It doesn't try to find proofs uh, by itself. And I don't even know if it's if it tries to do small steps by itself. Maybe it can, but I'm not sure about this. Uh, and uh, your second question is completely in a different direction. My favorite computer algebra system, because Lean is definitely not a computer algebra system. Um, uh, I'm using several ones. I'm using uh, a system called GAP. Uh, GAP is originally a system um, which was built for group theory, but uh, it has a language which actually bypassed Python. Actually, Python was uh, modeled on the on this version of GAP on the on version three of GAP, and now GAP is in version four, and a language which is uh, more close to GAP. Um, is Julia, so I like probably we will shift to Julia in the future but I also depending on what I want to do sometimes use Maple or use Mathematica but my main programming is in, in the language called GAP and uh, our goal is to become GAP agnostic so that a lot of the stuff we're writing because it's actually category, category theory that we uh, make a huge amount of our code simply code agnostic, uh, language agnostic so uh, that it's written in a meta language and it can compile to GAP or, or Python or Julia or Mathematica or any of these other computer algebra systems. I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks again uh, for all the good questions. Uh, yeah, I think I will do the uh, last mic check. So if oh, sorry, go... sorry. <laughs> One more question. Okay, Hansen, go sorry. ahead. Sorry. Uh, so, so you mentioned that you're not using the uh, uh, the exclusive middle uh, or the no. uh, contradiction, no. proof by contradiction. 
why is that? Um, because of the, uh, the, the, the constructive, uh, tr- constructivism, uh, pre- prevents you from yeah. excluding yeah. you from the because, because the law of excluded middle doesn't have an algorithmic interpretation, uh, basically because of the halting problem, you know, uh, you, you cannot prove a or not a, and the halting problem is such an example of undecidability. I see. Yeah. So once you, once you, you put in the, this logical axiom, uh, in your uh, logical repertoire, you have cut yourself from any algorithmic interpretation of your proofs. Your proofs become formally okay relative to the, this uh, logical system, but it has no interpretation in algorithms. And this is why the people who are doing uh, uh, constructive mathematics, they are usually talking in about proof extraction. Uh, no, it's called an alg- algorithm extraction. So when they do a proof, they know in principle by the uh, what it's called the uh, uh, Curry Howard isomorphism. I think there is in principle a way to extract an algorithm from the proof. The only thing is that there uh, I'm coming from the other side. I'm making algorithms directly. I'm not making proofs and uh, extracting algorithms. I'm designing the algorithms. So. Uh, what I know is that usually the the algorithms you extract from these constructive proofs are very inefficient, but they are still algorithms. Yeah? And I'm trying to encounter the problem from the other side. I'm trying to put more logic around the algorithms and more type system, and so that we uh, we can at some moment write down uh, proofs coming from algorithms. So I want to. Um, make my algorithms into proofs. I want to have a, a context that uh, enables me to uh, uh, show that this, this algorithm is in fact a proof. Yeah? And then the, 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 uh, the algorithm I extract is then the original al- algorithm I design. Yeah? So I don't let this high principle uh, produce the algorithm in the background because for sure it will be a very crappy algorithm, which it is, in, which it is usually is. Well, thank you so much. And uh, one, one more question. The uh, uh, I, I'm sure that well, the neural network can be used to explore the uh, the mathematics and then uh, proof. Uh, just a couple of months ago, the uh, I think DeepMind um, uh, showed an example of um, using the uh, neural network to explore the uh, space to come up with. Uh, the, or let's say the uh, sieve sift down or filter down the uh, uh, the possible conjectures. Uh, of course, the the the, the, um, the software didn't prove anything. Just um, uh, giving examples, just like we usually use computers to give um, uh, the uh, make finding examples patterns and then get find the conjecture pad, patterns. find patterns. Exactly, exactly, exactly. The uh, filter down things. Uh, do you? Do you, uh, do you, would you find it um, useful for the neural, the use of the neural net? And then second question is, uh, you're basically, let's say, in the either lean or other software or your constructive algorithm, do you think, um, it, do you envision a way to inject the uh, logic into neural network, uh, the, let's say, either through graph, um, and it's constructing a graph, uh, 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 the, the uh, d- directed acyclic graph, um, and injecting uh, the logic into the neural net to help with help, help um, with its um, logical deduction ability. Uh, so these are the two questions. I, I don't know if I uh, if you got <laughs> the, the long winded question. Yeah, 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 I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I heard about this research, and it's, of course, very nice. I mean, uh, our brain works, we learn by pattern recognition, I think, and at, at least this is one, one major component. Our, our knowledge is uh, cumulative knowledge, and we learn by pattern recognition. And uh, personally, I don't believe in, in somehow genius leaps. I, I see this as, a, as more in this Grotendieck style of this rising sea principle. And... Uh, um, 
I think that neural network will help us on both things. First of all, to help us discover patterns that we were not aware of because of their sheer computational power. And uh, finding a proof is also uh, thinking in concepts and uh, in higher concepts. And I don't see anything why, so any reason why neural networks cannot uh, develop this ability at some point point in the future. So sometimes I joke and say I'm happy to be one of the last generations of mathematicians because uh, I'm sure that in a couple of uh, generations we'll also be uh, superseded by by uh, artificial intelligence. I don't I, I think our brain is a Turing machine and it's a sophisticated Turing machine that has many levels of abstraction and it has many levels of, uh, in, in these many levels of abstraction or the ability to make many levels of abstraction, it's very good at finding patterns, but it's not excellent in finding patterns. And um, if neural networks can catch up with building abstraction, they will definitely be better than us in, in finding patterns. But of course, the, the, the source of our intuition is also daily life. So a lot of ideas I got uh, for my work, or at least one very decisive idea I got for my work, was playing with my children. So the input uh, is very diverse for a human than just uh, a machine uh, thinking about this problem very hard. And sometimes you know that you might think about a problem, you go to sleep, your brain is unwired again, you open up and your uh, the the uh, the the, the block blockade has vanished because the wiring is is away the wiring in your brain that caused the blockade is away and uh, I think if neural networks uh, maybe there is even a much better way so you don't even need to sleep and to unwire your brain or unwire the network but I'm I'm very optimistic that in the next uh, few decades uh, our intelligence on all on all levels will be superseded. But this is taking us oh, away uh, from the topic. I know. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So, so second question: uh, the about the the uh, the injecting the uh, let's say the logic uh, through let's say the uh, graph uh, directed acyclic graph into the neural net. Uh, do you have any do you have any thoughts on, no, on that? No. Well, um, what, what I know uh, is that okay. people in people in Google are already starting. Uh, um, uh, automatic proving, so not just proof assistance, but automatic proving. And uh, I can send you. Um, so there is a guy. I think he's uh, Polish or Hungarian called. Uh, uh, I, I cannot pronounce his name. Uh, Skidi or something like this. He's working at Google and he's co-authoring now a lot, some papers where they have uh, using the uh, neural network proved uh, something like 100 and 1020 theorems and uh, classical theorems in mathematics. So they're not deep, but uh, uh, and some of the proofs are even more elegant than the human proofs. So I can point you to this, uh, to this de development. And I think this will accelerate. And uh, I'm sure in 10 years, uh, you will hear more, not, not just about pattern recognition, in finding the formulation of what you want to prove, but also in proofs uh, simply uh, uh, given by the machine. And then we will have a, maybe a trouble because we need to understand the proof in a human mind. So we, we need the, 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 the so probably the, the neural network will c collaborate with the proof assistant so that the proof assistant tells us, yes, the proof is correct. But when we look as, at humans at the proof, we will understand zero because our brain functions differently. We need really to fun we our brain functions in concepts. You know, we have to, we cannot have a long, long, long sequence just of deductions. Our brain doesn't work this way. We need to break out the proof into a lot of concepts. And uh, 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 building a concept and fostering the concept and being comfortable with the concept is what at the end leads to the point that you say a human accepts the proof. You know, I, I think there are some uh, uh, proofs in mathematics lying around where uh, the reviewer doesn't understand the proof because it's a long sequence. And uh, uh, a solution for these people who claim to have proofs that uh, they cannot convince their, uh, their peers, their human peers, that this is a proof, 
that they should start formalizing the pro their proofs if they yeah, can check. convince the machine yeah if they, if they can convince the machine the, the we will be convinced of course yeah but still as humans we want to understand so the next level would be that you want to train your neural network not just to find uh, an incredibly long se sequence of ded deductive arguments but to in the way to build a theory and i don't know how how easy it is but uh, maybe the machine acquires some artificial uh, uh, general intelligence or general artificial intelligence or whatever you call it and at some moment they will be able to understand how we how we are wired and what we need to understand proofs but i don't know if at that moment we will be so interested in proofs i don't know i think the ultimate solution would be uh we meld uh, ourselves with the with the neural network or ai together into one yeah i think so i hope so <laughs> So, uh, Professor, I just had one more question. You happen to mention that, uh, I think as a closing question, as Sarah said, but uh, you happen to mention that uh, one of your, uh, you know, bits of intuition came from playing with your kids. So I was just curious about that and wondering if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, so I, um, I was searching for an algorithm and um, uh, I needed at some point to uh, find an inverse to one of the steps that uh, look genuinely just going in one direction. And um, uh, I needed this intuition from my children that uh, uh, during their play, they had no, uh, no problem in uh, doing the jumps backwards. And um, Somehow I slept and the next day I woke up and said, maybe the inverse I'm looking for is just formal. And I just need to compose these formal steps. And at the end, the formality is away and I really get uh, um, uh, something which is not just formal again. It's very much like uh, the invention of, of rational numbers. A rational number is just a formal inverse. Yeah, you're taking when you say two over three, you are assuming that you can invert three. But if you multiply two over three with three, then you get two again. And this is, was exactly what I was looking for. I wanted just formal inverses to some of the steps that if I, uh, um, uh, if I uh, just take the product of all of these formal steps, I get something which is genuine again, something which lives in my, in that case, it was in my category, in my abelian category. And, uh, I saw this through through the, the the movements of my children. They were making a lot of, f uh, for me, formal movements, and at the end they were just standing again on their feet. You know, so the, the, you see, it's very awkward why the intuition came from this, but <laughs> it came because our our brain is functioning in a very awkward way. You know, it's using a lot of these. Uh, very awkward pattern recognition and can bypass it on different levels. Ooh, thank you so much. Mohammed, this has been absolutely awesome. Thank you. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. This is really You're a really nice lecture. Really impressed with you. Thank you. You're welcome, Paula. I'm happy you're there. And of course, looking forward to much more discussions. Of course. So my brain is starting to melt slowly, <laughs> but there are two more um, guests on the panel, Daniel and Alex. So go ahead. Uh, well, I was just wondering uh, uh, on this topic of machine learning and theorem proving. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to state the theorem and then ask the computer to uh, come up with a proof, right? Uh, but is there any hope of creating um, some kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence that is able to recognize what are important theorems to to prove? And I, is there a way to approach that? This is uh, uh, a very difficult question because important theorem uh, uh, 
also has to do with aesthetic. So is it an important because it's solving some problems which are currently hot? Because you can maybe find a theorem which will solve you the problem that will you will encounter in the next 100 years. But you don't value it at the moment, you know, because you didn't as a human build the entire theory. So imagine imagine uh, uh, a genius like Gauss, yeah? And uh, at that time, machine learning has emerged and it's talking about infinity categories and infinity toposes, yeah? And it's proving really deep theorems in these theories. <laughs> I think Gauss would have, wouldn't have been thrilled about this. He would have said this is all crap, you know? But nowadays we appreciate these theorems because we have we our brains uh, have evolved to understand this complexity and um, um, so the, the notion of uh, useful or, or or relevant or is very fuzzy it really it has to do with where we stand now where we humans stand now do you agree uh to some extent but i'm wondering whether like in the space of all possible uh, theorems that are are true that there are kind of bottlenecks in in how you can reach them and uh, there are particular useful intermediate steps and those could be considered to be an important theory. Yeah. So I think, for example, something like the Shur's Lama. Yeah, you see this everywhere. Or when you right. come up inventing uh, Dinkin diagrams, you see them everywhere. So uh, the machine will probably understand this. That there are some structures that pop up everywhere and uh, it will try maybe to generate more truth about them so that it can use it at much more places. And maybe this is the way it will evaluate the theorem internally, the, 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 evaluate the, the lemmata, lemmata and propositions and theorems internally. The stuff it uses most, which is connected to all the other truths it was able to prove, maybe this will get a higher weight and then it might be uh, willing or, or uh, enthusiastic about teaching us what is what it discovered and what is now helpful for it to prove all these many different things. Right, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this has been uh, interesting. I haven't actually been on Clubhouse for a long time, but uh, when I see the halting problem, um, I get very curious. Um, so, you know, I was a professor of physics, uh, did string theory and early universe um, cosmology. Um, and these were some of the topics that we always sort of skirted around, especially when you think about uh, quantum reality. And <clears throat> certainly um, now being in AI, um, the, the amazing power of transformer networks to do virtually almost anything, including uh, hypothesis testing and sort of deep theorem proving, um, seems almost like there's a ubiquitous sense that um, th that sort of first order predicate logic has been skirted um, and we've been able to surpass some of the difficulties with um, these types of systems which aren't quantum mechanical. So my question to you is um, do you believe that there's some sort of inherent um, difficulty in understanding the halting problem from a quantum perspective? which is to say sort of an infinite, infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So I'm, I'm, I read a bit about uh, uh, hypercomputation and its connection to uh, quantum mechanics, because I'm interested, if, is there any hope that there is some resource in the physical world that could give us some sort of hypercomputation to render the halting problem decidable in, uh, in some hypercomputational universe above the church Turing the uh, ceiling, as I call it. Um, there are some people who uh, wrote such papers, but uh, the entire um, uh, research uh, is, um, I would say, hypothetical. So even the experiments they proposed is, uh, um, I think, were not, uh, were not made. Uh, I read some papers about hypercomputation computation using quantum mechanics, but um, I think if there is a breakthrough, everyone will hear about it, right? Um, 
I'm interested in quantum computations, but quantum computations are still below the church Turing uh, ceiling. Yeah, no, exactly. I think for me, the, the biggest um, schism there is just that within sort of a first order predicate logic system, you're, you're fundamentally encoding things, um, you know, in some sort of gated potential um, versus what's actually happening in our brain, which is really at the threshold of the quantum. So um, I'm... I'm always, you know, and certainly back when I was a professor, I probably didn't entertain these possibilities as much as I do now. But um, there, there seems to be um, there seems to be a different uh, version of AI once it's able to be put on a truly quantum mechanical basis. Yeah, but uh, it will still be Turing complete. So maybe I, I was now talking about things that. Uh, um, per, uh, supersedes Turing completeness and uh, so I, I'm not sure for example if our brain is doing any th- quantum mechanical operations and if they are relevant for for uh, how it's functioning I didn't hear so I, I, I read of some people who claim this and I think even uh, Penrose claimed this but uh, I didn't see anything solid about this uh, really in the but maybe you know more. You can tell me more. Um, I mean, I certainly think that, um, you know, Penrose's claim is interesting and, you know, the whole discussion on microtubules and things like that. But um, really, when it comes down to it, we know hybridization exists, right? And without that, there's no quantum chemistry. And without that, there's no consciousness. So th- there's something that I'm, you know, at least happy to be agnostic about that <clears throat> seems to be very different than. Uh, gated logic. Just yes, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, I think if we're talking about complexity, then I would agree. I would definitely agree. I mean, uh, um, complexity really depends on uh, on the notion of computation you start with. So if you start with com- quantum computers, the, the whole starting point of complexity shifts. Then things which are if you're coming from this realm is uh, exponentially but exponential but if you come from that realm it's polynomial so i agree with this but uh, for me all this is still uh, if you discard complexity and discard time so if you think you have all the time in the world then all this is still below the church turing the- ceiling so fundamentally uh, it's the same hmm. yeah certainly being in the the universe we inhabit, um, which is a decider type exponential expansion, um, there seems to be a time limit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, really a pleasure. And uh, uh, Mohammed, I'm just last question. Um, you know, without looking you up, I mean, what is your exact field of research in mathematics? I'm doing um, computer algebra, and I'm trying to do it in a new way. Um, I'm trying to do computer algebra using category theory as a programming language. And we have implemented category theory on the computer, and we're using it really to program, which is uh, becoming slow because we're building this abstraction towers of categories. So one of my PhD students students is now building a compiler for category theory. So this is our active research. Sounds exactly like the torture you would give a PhD. <laughs> and well, he's very fantastic. good at this. He's very good at this. Um, is it, this wouldn't happen to be on GitHub, would it? It's all on GitHub. You just uh, oh, you just uh, Google compiler for CAP and you'll find it. You can Google something called the, the Home Alc project. Uh, Home Alc comes from homological algebra. H O M A L G homological algebra, home alg project, and then you can go to something called CAP or CAP-based packages, and then you will see compiler for CAP, and then you can read Excellent. a bit about the compiler. This is great. Um, I'm going to share this with some colleagues I have at uh, OpenAI that are into this kind of stuff. They'll prob- they probably already know about it, but this is, this is fantastic. Yeah, I, I love category theory. It's the correct programming language, not just for abstract mathematics, but I would say for computer algebra. So, so interestingly enough, uh, Paul and I were just chatting in the in the chats here, and um, uh, one of the th- one of the theses that I have about string theory is that uh, open strings are really um, uh, they're they're really like realizations of the plus sign in category theory. 
of the plus sign. Yeah, I mean, there's some sort of implicit plus sign in categories. So there's a way to... Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please include me in the discussion. I'd be interested. Excellent. Um, I've got a meeting, but really a pleasure, everybody. Ciao. Thank you very much. Thank you for being there. Yes, yeah, thanks, Arwa here. Uh, it has been a uh, fascinating uh, yeah, two hours, 30 minutes. Appreciate Arwa's uh, insights, questions, uh, and comments. Especially thanks for the uh, ha uh, Mohammed, the fascinating presentation and speech and great question and answer sections. So we would like uh yeah we would much like to invite you again to talk more interesting questions and topics like computing algebra and also uh the compiler project you are working on yeah so yeah it's a great pleasure and great honor to be here yeah thanks everyone uh yeah if there is no closing thoughts uh, i will invite the cell up here uh so yeah, so it's a tradition uh, to do the uh, time counting, um, yeah, uh, to close the room, and we look forward to more interesting discussion. So uh, also uh, for the audience, if you are first time to know about uh, Muhammad, please give him a follow, so he will definitely bring you to the interesting rooms. And we are honored to have Paul here. So he also have a fascinating club called It's About Time. Uh, it's talking about the causality and the time and the, you know, the nature of time and space time. And uh, for the computer scientists, engineer and uh, scientists. Uh, so please uh, follow Paul and his amazing club. And also definitely follow Quantum Photonics Club. We will invite our amazing guest speakers here again in the future. Um, yeah, I will uh, pause for a little bit if there is any appreciation, comments, or thought. If not, I will pass back to Dasel. Yeah, again, thanks everyone. Thanks to you for the wonderful organization and the invitation, and I really enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, we really enjoyed your talk, and uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, we would want to have you um, here a little longer now, but maybe we can invite you back. And I'm very excited to hear your talk about uh, um, computational algebra, and uh, um, also maybe you can walk us with uh, maybe some Millennium problems and um, other uh, math topics in the future. I think uh, you have a captive audience already here so yeah we are so excited to have you back so thank you so much Muhammad. thank you very much and i encourage everyone to um, follow paul and you will find me in paul's rooms <laughs> they're really fantastic rooms as well uh, like the room here so um, i would encourage you to follow both clubs they're really fantastic thank you very much yeah, i also would like to thank paul uh, who visited us today yeah please follow his club Hi guys, hi Sierra Cecile, great room, great room, great talk professor, and hey Paul, nice to see you. All right, there are nine of us on stage, so we're going to start with nine. All right, okay, we'll start with eight. How about that? Everybody ready? Yeah, ready. Ready. <laughs> eight. 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 Seven. 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 Route 66. Six. 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 <laughs> Professor, you are number one. Go ahead and call out the last number. Um, my last number is definitely um, the oil mashahori um, number. I don't know if you know about it, but <laughs> make it a prime. Oh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 this goes into into a reformulation of the Riemann hypothesis. I like this number very much. <laughs> Do we halt now? 
So, by the way, it's 0 0.57721566490153 and so on. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so impressed. It keeps on everything. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank, you. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Have, good have a good day. Have a good night, everyone. And we will see you very soon. Bye.